Circuit 42 would like to thank Pop Culture Paradise, Toy Anxiety, The Spawn Point Gamers Lounge, and Dragon's Lair San Antonio. I'm looking, uh, and I'm looking at David Lynch. Yep, with a cow. <laughs> yeah, with a cow. <laughs> so, um, so you were traveling today? Oh uh, yeah, I was over in Austin. Am I coming in okay? Can you hear uh, me all right? Yeah. Are you giving any kind of feedback? No, I'm not. It's just that I'm talking to you through my microphone and my my iPad Mini rather than like holding a phone up to my face. So. Okay. Just let me know if this isn't going to work, because I can always switch over. Oh, it works perfectly fine, but I know you, okay. you said that you were kind of tired. So I'm if... okay. I'm all right. I'm, I'm uh, you know, I, I, I'd rather not, you know, if, it's, if you're ready to go, then let's, you know, I'm, I'm okay now. I just needed a, a little bit of time to sort of, you know, my, for my brain to start functioning properly. Sounds good, man. When you're on a deadline, um, well, when I'm in a deadline, I tend to burn the night oil and then... And then the morning oil, and sometimes the afternoon oil, and then and then I'm finished. But then it's like um, my day is wrecked, so I have to kind of catch up and sometimes. I, and I know a lot of the, I know a lot of the work you do, you do, especially in nocturnals, it's kind of all in one. It's kind of all, you know, it's kind of one and done. And you do a lot of it, but you do pretty much everything on your own. I try to, but you know, I, I do I do other things with with you know I do collaborate with writers and things like that, you know when uh, those jobs come about. But uh, recently, I've been I'm trying to think. The last time I did something with another writer was probably well, I was working on a Made Fire story uh, for their treatment um, uh, property. I don't know if you're familiar with Made Fires, the stuff they put out. Uh, Are you familiar I'm, with Made Fire at all? Uh, I'm not. You're not? That's interesting. Um, well, they do motion comics uh, that are very innovative and a lot more interactive. And that's, yeah, they're more interactive, I guess, but they're also more immersive. They use uh, sound and music and uh, everything short of animation and actual voices on the stuff that they do. And they've been doing tons of stuff with other companies. The app is free um you can go on to deviant art and and watch a lot of stuff for free and there's just just in the last year they started doing um just this i guess this last year they started doing uh, more pay stuff and uh it's i i have to say it's it's very impressive the stuff they're doing it's it's um it's crazy i mean they they're very favored by apple they've got all kinds of uh, investment in seed money. Uh, their, their company's out of Berkeley. It's run by uh, Liam Sharp and um, two other guys from outside of comics. And uh, not to make this a uh, you know an interview about them, but they uh, they approached me about doing something with one of Dave Gibbons' properties called Treatment, which is sort of like televised police action of the future show, and it takes place in different cities around the world and. And they asked me if I wanted to do treatment in Edinburgh, which would have been like a two-parter. So you're looking at like, uh, I guess, something like, is it 15 pages per chapter or more? I can't remember. It's, it's doing that. But but um, you're working very differently in that not everything on the screen is static. A lot of stuff it moves around and there's layers. And they even do like 360-degree views of things. So they've been able to put out some pretty amazing stuff and they're growing quite rapidly in the last two years and I was working on a, a story for them when this Batman job came about and they sort of I thought I thought maybe I could juggle them because there, there wasn't like a, a hard deadline for either one and I thought I can't put either one of these down I, I, I'm they're too awesome to just like you know let one go by the wayside but it got to the point where I, it was getting harder to juggle both, and I finally told uh, you know, um, you know, I told the Made Fire guys what I was doing, and the editor over there, Ben Abernathy, it turns out that he set up um, Legends of the Dark Knight for DC Digital back when he was working uh, under Hank Canals, and so he knew not only my editor, but he knew that project, and he knew the whole thing, frontwards and backwards already. And I and he's still you know friendly with Hank, and he said let me talk to him. 
let me talk to Hank. So he talked to my DC editor, and they kind of just, you know, they talked for a little while and he got back to me and they said, look, you know, we understand that you're writing this thing and and you're doing the artwork and it's a, it's a great opportunity and we don't want to hold you back. <clears throat> so, you know, we'll we'll just we'll, we'll put the the made fire, you know, the we'll put our projects um, on the back burner for a while until you can you know get this one out of the way and then we'll come back to it. And I just couldn't believe that. No one's ever done that for me before. That's pretty cool that you have a company who's not willing to work with you as well, a, um, as an artist. I, I I really I'm so grateful for them for that because I love those guys. Um, Liam's a friend, and I've become very friendly with a lot of the people at the company. And they're just really enthusiastic people with nothing but, I don't know, it's like they're they're in this sort of golden age right now with the company where they're everything is just like the sky's the limit for them. And I really wanted to be part of that because I think what they're doing is just amazing. If you, if you, if you go and you check out some of the stuff they're doing and some of the innovative – kinds of storytelling they're doing by being able to move things and to cause motion to happen on the on the page just that alone not to mention the music and the sound effects and the, the artists and the, and the stories that they're telling uh, I just wanted to be part of that I just feel like it's part of the future of this medium and the fact that they didn't turn me away and they could have they could have totally turned me away. They could have they could have been offended by it. They could have taken it personally. They're just not like that at all. And um, I'm just I'm very thrilled. And so we're still we still talk, and we're 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 doing some other things. We're they're 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 kind of all over the place. They're not just doing motion comics anymore. They've they have they've expanded the base to be able to do whatever a person wants to do. If you want to do a static comic, the digital, you can do that. If you want to make make a little bit of a motion thing, you can. A lot is even better. They have a tool that they've just made um, public, so anyone can pick it up, download it, and use it, which is also amazing. And it's going to help, you know, explode the platform even more. I think as uh, as years go by. And I also just noticed from the time I started talking to him about what I was what I was doing with with DC. Now it looks like the story I've done, or I'm doing right now. I'm not done with it. Not halfway through. For for DC may end up being a made fire product by virtue of the fact that DC is doing a bunch of stuff with them now. So we may have come complete, almost full circle with this, you know, so that's even better. That's that kind of luck that almost never happens. You know, that kind of situation. So it's one of those yeah. things that when it does, you really, you definitely take advantage of it. Well, you know, I've, I, it's funny because, you know, I've been doing this for what, over 25 years now. And there have been times when I've looked back on a, on a situation and, and thought, well, I probably, Maybe I made the mis- a mistake there. Maybe I made the wrong turn. Maybe I, I should have zigged instead of zagged. And you can always go back. Hindsight's always twenty twenty. But it's nice to to not to be able to look back on something and, and realize that you know you didn't have to uh, you weren't you didn't have to pick door or A or door B this time. You know, you someone lets you off the hook and they didn't hold you accountable. They didn't hold it against you. I mean, there's there, there's ed- editors that'll that'll never work again. And there are editors that'll, that'll never work with me again. And a lot of times, it's over silliness. It's um, I mean, I know I know freelancers who have gotten a, a rotten reputation from an editor because of a mistake they've made that wasn't worth their whole career. It wasn't worth their whole career, but then they paid for it for years. You know, um, yeah. and that's not fair. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's like, it's really it's and it's it's in other. In other forms, you know, in other markets and other jobs and careers and things like that, uh, they're mediums that isn't necessarily the, the case. But sometimes in comics, it can be very personal. It's a small, a small pond, and when a rock is thrown into it, it makes lots of ripples. So to be able to work with people who don't hold you accountable in extreme ways is very gratifying. <laughs> you know, it makes you feel good when you when you feel like you've you've built relationships with people and they don't. Um, they don't fall back on pettiness, you know? Exactly. Um, so people, anybody listening to us already, already has a pretty, or obviously has a pretty solid idea of who you are, you know, what kind of guest you are, you're a comic book artist and writer as well. But for those who don't know or those who need clarification, Dan, who are you and what do you do? I... 
<laughs> the loaded so question start... of the day. Because <laughs> you do a lot. I am white, dude. I am what? I was going to say, I said it's kind of the loaded question of the day because you do a lot. Like, a lot more than people realize within, um, within comics and graphic work. You know, it's funny because I, I guess I have to agree with that only, only for the reason that I tend to feel pigeonholed by some things I've done in the past. The first book I did um, that got any notoriety was a painted, a fully painted graphic novel called The Black Terror Seduction of Deceit. And it was written by both Smith and Chuck Dixon. We've and actually was, had Chuck on the show. Uh, yeah, Chuck is great. Yeah, um, he was our first guest, actually. That's awesome. That's awesome. I think a lot of Chuck and his work. Um, and, you know, he was one of the first writers I worked with. And he... I worked more with Bo, I think, than Chuck, because it was Bo's uh, sort of baby, this Black Terror revamp that we did back in... I think it came out in like the end of 89 so that was the first book that I did that sort of put me on the map and it wasn't it was a crime it was crime fiction you know adventure action a masked character um, and then after that I think the second thing I did was for DC Comics it was called The Psycho and it was a creator owned project with Jim Hutton uh, and it was uh, sort of this masked almost psychotic vigilante character working in the espionage community who goes up against uh, other uh, members of the es- espionage community who are sort of walking weapons of mass destruction. It's it's an alternate uh, sort of universe where it's a drug that gives you superpowers or gives a small population of the people that, or a small percentage of the people who take it superpowers. And they work as mercenaries and operatives and things like that. And that was, you know, sort of a spy slash super powered sort of costumed character book. Uh, my point being is the first two books I did were not horror books. Um, the third book I did was a painted graphic novel, again painted, uh, called Dread, which was an adaptation of a Clyde Barker short story from his Books of Blood series. And that was very obviously very dark horror um, and then after that we're talking about 1992 at this point 93 I did Legends of the World's Finest which was Batman and Superman fighting a, a Scottish sorcerer from you know whatever century uh, had the silver banshee in it had man bat in it so there were monsters in that one and and then after that we came up to 1994 by the end of 1994 the first issue of uh, Nocturnals came out which was another creator own book and that was the first book that I wrote and illustrated completely by myself and after that I basically had a reputation for doing monsters and dark material and obviously for being a person who did painted work I it wasn't that I couldn't do pencils or inks or anything like that and I did in fact do and have done plenty of it it just got this monster tag um i'm not unhappy about it i don't think it necessarily it's not, it's not necessarily undeserved but it has kind of put me in this kind of little box and i would love to do more crime fiction i would love to do more straight superhero stuff um but i tend to not get it as much because they think of me as the monster guy Every once in a while, because I did a book called Thrill Killer in 1996, and then I did another one again, and again in 98, um, which was in Elseworlds, Batman and Batgirl and Robin Elseworlds. Yep, I remember that one. It was really yeah. good. Set in the early 60s kind of crime universe, which uh, Howard Shaking wrote. I actually pitched the, the idea to Archie Goodwin um, at DC uh, several years. Or probably might be like the year we did it I, is when I pitched it. I just had this crazy idea. And uh, so I pitched it to Archie, and I said, I think I think Howard would be great for it, to write it, you know. Um, and so I, t- I had a conversation with Howard about it, and we both completely agreed that it was a great idea, and, and it was a great opportunity for us to do something different. And it sold in very solid numbers. It was popular. Um, it's gotten me work from, from people who remembered it when, you know, they were college age or high school age. And these guys end up becoming editors 
And then, hey, oh yeah, I saw Thrill Killer back when I was in high school, <laughs> which is really bizarre. And so, so that helps from time to time get me work other than in a monster, supernatural, horror vein. But I sort of tend to think of myself as who I am is, is someone who's in the, I think working in the uh, tradition of, of pulp writers and pulp artists as much as someone who grew up loving Marvel Comics in the 70s, in the late 60s and 70s. Um, I, I, my, my influences are so wide and varied, which I think you could say that about a lot of artists, but, you know, I mean, they, from, you know, the golden age of illustration with N.C. Wyeth and Dean Cornwell and guys like that, all the way up to Frazetta, um, you know, this Jack Kirby, Gene Cullen, John Buscema, moving up to you know, Bernie, Bernie Wrightson and Will, Bill Stout. I, I mean, just the influences, inspirations from just the point of view of artists is it's just huge for me. I, and I don't necessarily think that that's again that's not um, you know unique necessarily. It's just it's just there's a lot of stuff that goes into the melting pot of of, of who I am as an artist, and that's just a, from the point of view, like I said, of just of, of artists. There's also writers and novelists and poets and TV show. I mean, you know, it's, I think that's like it's like that for anyone who does anything artistic. Is um, these things influence you through your life and. I think the more stuff you put in to the melting pot, the better the brew. Yeah, it because comes out of it. sorry. No, go ahead. It kind of comes into that out of that idea that one of the one of the best pieces of advice for people getting into any medium is to not just look at that medium for influence because if you do that, it's kind of like um, there was a pretty controversial but honestly very true statement by um, Hayao Miyazaki of uh, Studio Ghibli fame where he actually said that the anime industry is dead. No, not, no he said it's at its worst point because these are people who don't go outside, who don't draw influence from the, from the world itself and people. They're drawing all their influence from anime that's already been produced. Mm. And that's the good thing is, you know, like one of the, like you were saying, like really, with what you were saying and with advi- just really good advice in general, Never just take from the one medium you're working in. Yeah, you real that you'll get the, you know, the more experience you get, the more mediums you look at, the more areas you look at, the more creative a person you're going to be. But that's just my I, opinion. No, I think you totally hit the nail on the head there. I mean, you're absolutely right. Uh, Miyazaki is absolutely right. You know, he's a genius. I'm also hugely inspired by him, and the fact this is the person who brings. He brings things to the medium. He doesn't. Uh, he's not a vampire. He's not just recycling stuff. And I, so anyway, I was talking with a friend uh, who in, 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 came over to the studio yesterday, and he was asking about comics that I read. And I said, you know, unfortunately, I don't read a lot of comics. Um, I'm not even sure that's an unfortunate thing to say. I guess it is kind of an unfortunate thing to say because I, I, I remember being in. Okay, I'll tell you a little story. I was I was in art school. This is in the '80s mid 80s to late 80s and I met uh, Mike Mignola when I was uh, going to California College of Arts and Crafts in Oakland he walked into one of my classes with another fellow named Steve Purcell he was another great artist oh yeah I know Steve well, Purcell yeah Steve um, you know he's at Pixar now he co-directed Brave and not sure what he's working on now I think he's working on one of those top secret things over there right now but these guys come walking in to see uh, our teacher Vince Perez um, who's very inspirational uh, teacher and artist who was, you know, working in the, in, in the illustration department there at the time, and he he sort of says to to these guys, hey, you should take this Brereton guy under your wing, this kid under your wing, because he's good and blah blah blah. And I had we it was a critique day, so we had all our work on the wall, and they went up and they were looking at people's work and they looked at my work, and later Mike described my stuff to another person. Who from comics named Arthur Adams, and he said uh, his stuff was the only stuff that when you looked at it up close, it still looked good. And which I knew, if you've been to art school and you've been, you know, to any crit day, you know exactly what he's talking about because you know people come and they put the stuff on the wall, and you'll look and you go, oh, that looks pretty good. Wow, look at that. And you'll get up closer to it and you see that in the finish stage, in the you know, in the in the fine tuning of the drawing and things like that. The composition, the composition doesn't hold up. The piece doesn't hold up. Um, and I remember 
feeling really like that was a real shot in the arm for me to hear that um and after talking getting to know these guys a little bit and talking to them more you come to find out that they don't really read a lot of comics anymore they're highly influenced by a lot of the same stuff you know Mignola is a huge fan of Bernie Wrightson and Jack Kirby and you know everyone knows about Mignola's influences and you know and Steve Purcell had his influences and Arthur Adams has his and but you know as far as what they were currently reading in comics because I was the guy who's going to comic book stores at least once a week if not twice a week well these guys were hardly going at all they just they had sort of dropped off as from being readers and the reason I was given then was well you know it's just when you're doing it for a living it changes things and I thought well that's sad but uh, I'm totally in the same boat now. Totally understand it. And that was my that was my answer to my friend was you know I just don't read a lot of books because for the very for, for the very reason that you that you gave that you know it's it's sort of this um, almost an incestuous uh, kind of ouroboros of of uh, material that's that's not coming as much from the outside as it should be. Uh, there's not as many outside influences. There's there's not enough research necessarily being done in comics to sustain all the books that are out there as far as them being of quality and, and bringing something new to the medium. Um, I'm not saying that that stuff doesn't exist. It's just like, you know, look at studio, the stuff that Studio Ghibli is doing is, is innovative and it's, it's keeping the medium alive and fresh uh, as far as anime goes. And we have a lot of that in comics, but we don't have enough of it. There's just a glut of stuff that's just, you know, really... I don't know. It's it's nothing I'm interested in. Let's just put it that way. So I do read a lot. I do try and um, let uh, the research that I do inform the stories that I tell a lot more. Or if I get an idea for a story, at least I research it. And I can't even say that I used to do that all the time. I think after I did uh, The Last Battle, um, which is this uh, Sword and Sandals graphic novel that was written by Tito Ferracci, who's a uh, pretty prevalent... European comics writer from Italy. They asked me to do this story um, that we've since gotten the rights to. We put out through Image as a graphic novel a couple of years ago. But uh, it was set in 52 BC during the siege of Elysia, you know, the, the Gauls versus the Romans. And I didn't know anything about that stuff. I knew about Asterix and Obelix. Okay, those that's that's what I knew about Romans and Gauls. Which actually, as it turns out, is because that stuff is, has, a, has a strong basis in history that it's not so bad. But I really just am not a student of history. I wasn't anyway. But I had to kind of set myself on this path to, to educate myself about, about the, the era and about both, both cultures. And, and just ancient history in general became um, an interest of interest to me. And I immersed myself in it for a good six months or so in researching this graphic novel. And ever since then, I've become much more in interested in, in history. And I think that you really, really have to, to research your stories and to bring something to the table that's worthwhile. And so the best writers, or at least my favorite writers, i found are, are doing a lot of research and they're bringing a lot of reality to a story with just a little bit of fantasy. Um, when, it, when it is a, a story that has fantasy in it, that is. Because I think a little bit of fantasy goes a long way rather than packing it with everything in the world that came out of your imagination. I mean, that, there's, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but I think you have, you have to back it up. <clears throat> and I find when I'm reading comics or watching movies or even reading, reading certain novels that if it's something that, I'm, that I think, oh, I could have written this, um, or... Or something where a lot of times it's an idea that you came up with that you've already sort of had, you've already gone through it in your head, uh, whether it was a book you did or a conversation you had or, you know, something that, 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 hit your, that, took, that, that sort of struck your fancy and that you wrote down in your, your notebooks, you know, for a week and before you got tired of it and moved on to something else. That these things have already come and gone and, and it's harder to look at it as purely a reader or a pers person looking to be entertained when it's something you do for a living. You find yourself being more critical. You find yourself editing things. You know, it's hard to turn your brain off. It's hard to turn that, that pro brain off. Um, and when I say that I, that I think, oh, I could have written this, I don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily saying that, I, that I'm 
I'm not, it's, it's not from the point of view of saying, oh, I'm, I'm better than this guy. It's just an idea will, will be presented that you've seen before, you know, or you have already kind of moved past that, you know. Um, everyone loves to <clears throat> mine in the, 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 the mountain of Lovecraft, okay? That's a good sort of example. And we've mined the Lovecraft uh, so much that it's starting to become a cliche, if it isn't already. And so it's time to start really looking inward and, and stop grabbing from these guys all the time. You know, uh, it's not necessarily that it gets old for the readers, but I mean, you can only go do so many sort of Lovecraftian type stories before it's time to move on to something else. I hope. You know, if you if you know what I'm, if you can follow what I'm saying. Yeah, I completely understand. That's just an example. <clears throat> not that Lovecraft isn't great, and Robert E. Howard isn't great, and Tolkien's not. Fan- you know, these guys are fantastic. I mean, they're 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 seminal for us. Um, but there's so much more out there. And one of the things that um, grabbed me so much about uh, True Detective was how they used uh, the work of Frank Chambers, Frank W. Chambers, who was. Um, I'm sorry, I say Frank, it's Robert Chambers, Robert W. Chambers, who wrote uh, this collection of short stories called The King in Yellow. And they took a lot of the stuff from The King in Yellow as part of this sort of imaginary cult, uh, these people that they were chasing down in the story. And that intrigued me quite a bit. And um, I wasn't really familiar with Chambers' work, so I, so that led me down the path toward toward you know, reading more of his work and discovering who he was, and and uh, I was really grateful for that. And I think that was really cool that they that they didn't uh, that you saw a little bit of that in there. The only problem is is that you know it's 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 sort of plagiarism, <laughs> kind of. I mean, a little bit. I mean, but it, is it any more plagiarism than than you know than it putting Cthulhu elements in your story? And I don't know, but um, it's cool to see references to things. Sometimes it gets you on the track to something else and and gets your mind working. And uh, that captivated me uh, as much about the series as anything else that recommends it. Uh, and Chambers, by the way, was someone that H.P. Lovecraft uh, was a fan of. Um, and some of the ideas in his stories informed Lovecraft's stories. Uh, and, of course, Chambers was himself influenced by Ambrose Bierce. So it all keeps going back and back, and when just when you think you found the guy who came up with all the ideas, you find out all his influences, you know, and that's another fascinating thing is to see how far it goes back into history and how we all owe a debt to somebody else for the stories that we're telling. One of the um, I was actually going to bring up two examples of people who have you know who have dug deep into things that they love, passion, and created something new out of it. Uh, one of them. Have you seen the movie Kiss Kiss Bang Bang? Sure, it's a great movie. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. Yeah, and yeah. I it, love it. And um, I'm watching the movie, and I'm and I'm recognizing a lot of detective story elements. So sure. I started doing some more research on it, and I realized that these are all based around Raymond Chandler stories. Mm-hmm. And I find out more and more about Chandler, and I started reading. And I started reading his stuff. And then you watch the interviews with Shane Black. And he said, yeah, this is basically taking the Raymond Chandler story ideas and showing what would actually happen in the real world. Mm. And that mm-hmm. kind of... In the made... real world. It's <clears throat> funny. I never, I never read that I never read that that, uh, that interview, but it's just funny that he would say in the real world, in the, in the contemporary world of Robert Downey Jr. and Val Kilmer and yep. a Shane Black, <laughs> in a Shane Black action film. But, like, the idea that, oh, don't worry, we'll throw this body. It will be fine. It'll land in the dumpster that hits the dumpster and falls on the road. It's yeah. almost like if you took Raymond Chandler and a comedy of errors and kind of put them together. Well, the funny thing about Raymond Chandler is is that there's plenty of comedy in Raymond, Raymond Chandler. The guy was hilarious. Uh, Philip Marlowe's character was, you know, he had this sort of way of looking at things that... Um, I think brought, brought a lot of levity to those stories. They're not dark. They're not. They're not dark in a sort of Dashiell Hammett, David Goodis kind of way. They're. Um, they're sort of. You know, the the main characters 
he's sort of an upbeat guy for all the, the problems that uh, come his way and, and the, the problems he makes for himself. But, yeah, it is true. Um, it, 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 it's a hilarious sort of, you know, the idea that a person could sort of I, – I love um, I love Bill Kilmer's character. He's just always there to remind uh, Robert Downey Jr. of how stupid he is and how cliched he is <laughs> yeah. or how stupid the cliches are. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a gem. That movie is really underrated, gem. In many ways, I I really wish that I just wish more people really knew about it because Robert Downey is great, but like you were saying, Kilmer, like he nails it. Like I for, I forget whenever I see him in something where he can be funny, I always forget how funny he can actually be. And I, I think, think the first yeah, I think the first movie I ever saw him in was a movie called real genius or something like that and it was a comedy he was like a he was a total quipster he had all the one-liners and the comebacks and uh, he's he's really funny you know i think when you don't give him when you don't when his character doesn't have a sense of humor and story i think that you're not really using him to his full abilities as an actor you get batman forever yeah 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 it's true well i mean batman forever is what you get when when you're not i don't know <laughs> it's if you're not if you're not minding the 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 kitchen, this is what you get when it you know when everything's finished. But uh, yeah, it's very true. You know, you need you need a little even. But he's even he even has a little bit of a sense of humor there too. It's it's funny that they've hired uh, comedic actors or actors who can do comedy to play the, to play the Batman part over the. It, it just shows I don't know a, a somewhat of a a lack of understanding of the of who Batman is. Um, Going all the way back to the '60s, you know, before all, this is all, of course, pre pre Kevin Nolan, or did I say Kevin Nolan? Oh uh, yeah, I, I, Chris I got Nolan. on the brain. <laughs> hey, not a problem. Uh, Kevin Kevin Nolan was awesome. I, I Kevin Nolan does the, the best Batman for what for that matter. Him <laughs> and um, who's the other one? Graham something. Graham something. Graham Nolan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, Kevin. I'm a huge fan of Kevin's stuff. I love his Batman. Love the way he portrays Batman, but uh, no. Uh, getting back to Shane Black and Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Uh, another thing that's great about that about that movie is uh, all the paperbacks of sort of this this literary character that some of the some of the people in the movie are interested in. Uh, all those paperbacks are Robert McGinnis covers, um, illustrated by Robert McGinnis, who did a lot of that stuff. And I'm a huge fan of that. So and that 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 also sucked me in too, because I'm a huge fan of Chandler. I love I love McGinnis. I love all I love all that stuff too. So I, I'm I'm definitely hooked into to you know crime fiction, mystery, pulp. Um, so I'm uh, that's that that stuff is I love it. I, I love storytelling that is spare, stripped down to its elements. I think that's what what that what drew me to crime fiction um, initially. Uh, that and the idea that you could tell st- stories about about characters who weren't heroic but were interesting, you know, these kind of amoral characters who um, are infinitely more interesting than the heroes a lot of the times. Uh, and it's for someone who grew up reading Fantastic Four and the Avengers and Thor and all that kind of stuff to to become interested in um, in crime fiction and uh, characters with you know moral ambiguity is an interesting transition. I'm not, I don't even know if, I, I don't even, I think it's interesting that a lot of people who read superhero stuff and mainstream comics ended up um, just in the last, I don't know what, five or six years with the advent of more crime fiction in, in you know, in comics, coming back into comics. Um, it seems like a lot of people are, were hungry for those kinds of stories. Um I mean, I don't, I'm not even sure you can put uh, Chandler's work and, and Philip Marlowe in the same category because Philip Marlowe is definitely a, a heroic character. You know, he's he's described as being the best man in his world, which I like a lot. I like the description. It's yeah, it's funny you you've been talking about Paul and its influence on you quite a bit. And hello, hello, can you hear me, Ian? Oh, sorry, I muted the microphone. I didn't want to interrupt while you were talking. Oh, that's um, okay. Not a problem. At first, so, thing I um, thought we, I got, we got lost here. No, we're good. Um, three, two, one. So you mentioned uh, you mentioned pulp, your pulp influences earlier, and how you had actually how Magnola was one of the artists who first saw your work. 
It, which actually, which actually ties into something I was going to bring up earlier that you, in many ways, your work has kind of always reminded me of Mandela, of Mandela's in a way, mm. not because of any stylistic um, um, similarities, but more so in the fact that both of you take have a, both of you, in my opinion, take the trappings of horror, but you don't make necessarily f- feel the need to make a horror story. And I've always thought that was really re- something really interesting and really refreshing. That well, I, thanks. I, I get what you're saying. I, I do get that, and I, thank you. Um, I, you know, it's funny because I have to sort of be careful when, you know, when, it's funny because the statement I made about comics and how there's so much of the sort of so many similar kinds of stories being told in comics. I think because a lot of people are reading comics, and I don't want to say they're, regurg- they're regurgitating storylines and ideas, but some of them are. Some of them are, and I, I think that's also because it's what some of the fans like. They want those kinds of stories. Um, they don't necessarily want you to sh- shake or stir the pot too much. But for me, um, I've, I've found that reading Mike's stuff is much more refreshing than, than most of the stuff I, I read in comics. And I do feel like I have an affinity for the kinds of that stuff he likes to do because he's you know, here's a person who grew up reading comics that were horror comics and superhero comics and, you know, loving Jack Kirby, but also loving Bernie Wrightson and, you know, um, and, and also love being interested in things that, that are outside the medium of comics and bringing them into the stories that are being told in comics. Um, my The danger with reading Hellboy is that so many of the ideas I found uh, that that he's putting into his stories overlap things that either I have done or I want to do. <clears throat> and it's a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous statement because it can, it can be misconstrued. It's just because we have a lot of similar interests, you know. Um, and when I have an idea for something I want to do and then I pick up a copy of Hellboy and I read it and I go, ah, oh, damn it. <laughs> there it is. Or, or, or something I've done already. Um, you know, so I do get people asking me a lot, like, why don't you do a Hellboy Nocturnals crossover? It seems like it would be the perfect thing to do. And my answer to that is, yeah, it sounds great on paper, but I don't know if there'd be enough. There, I mean, I'm sure there would be a contrast. You know, I mean, obviously, the two things are very different. You know, Hellboy and Nocturnals are very different. but And there are similarities as, as far as things that we find interesting to put into stories. But I almost feel like it's too close you know it's too close in the same neighborhood because i can't even think of anything else when i was doing nocturnals for the first time in 90 working on it in 93 94 95 whatever um the only thing that was in close to it was hellboy which is not to say they're close they're not it's just it's the closest thing you could come to um since 1994 when nocturnals uh debuted and 20 years have passed there's a lot of stuff that comes out that's similar to it um, you know, taking horror and crime and putting it together in sort of in, with a sort of a superhero kind of uh, rapping, almost a superhero rapping, uh, was not something that was being done. There were no little girl characters in mainstream comics in 1994. The closest was Kitty Pride, who's a teenager and an X Men. Um, you know, there were no court, there were no Halloween girls, there were no Courtney Crumerins, there were, you know, I mean, there's countless, there's no, there were no chant, leave it to chances, nothing like that. Um, and and I figured pff, people were going to hate Halloween girl. I thought they're going to hate. She's a little girl. She's an innocent little girl. They're going to hate her. <laughs> and actually, I was wrong. That's not true at all. Which is great. Which is very rewarding. But um, no, I, I I feel like. The, the stories that have that sort of horror trapping that are but but aren't necessarily horror stories are kind of what I'm shooting for you know I, I I really enjoy painting and drawing and coming up with characters that are outside of sort of the the realm of normalcy but putting them in a setting that's more like a hard-boiled story that's pretty much what I wanted to do with Nocturnals. I wanted to, there were all these ideas that, that, that were showing up in my sketchbooks and in my notebooks, and they were coming together into, and coalescing into this one uh, entity that turned out to be Nocturnals. 
And for the longest time, I didn't know what I was going to do with all these things. I didn't know how they all fit together, and they just started to fit together piece by piece. Um, once I had a framework to, to drape the whole story over, it started to come together. And I I could do a straight uh, crime comic, or I could do a straight supernatural comic, but it's just not it's not what I'm interested in doing right now. I mean, at least not for this. So I, I think that, um, you know, people who read a lot of comic books can get... I mean, you know, they're, they, I've noticed that, like, you know, if you're a superhero, if you're a superhero guy, you want to read superhero comics. If you're a Walking Dead guy, you want to read, you know, horror comics. Um, but then there's this, there's this other level of fan, or this other sort of branch of fans, who read all that stuff, and they digest all that stuff. And so when you show them something that not only brings some other element in that they're not familiar with, but mixes it into the pot with these other familiar elements into something brand new, I think that's exciting. I get excited about that. Uh, I think there are a lot of people who would tell you that the comics that they're doing, uh, we, either they're writing or they're drawing or they're doing both, the ones that they're doing are the things that, that they would want to see as a comic, that would get them interested in reading a comic. Uh, and that's how I feel about Nocturnals. It's the comic that I would want to read uh, that's not being done. It's it's the sum total of, uh, you know, I would say mostly the sum total of, of the things that I, I love about comics and storytelling. Not everything, you know, obviously, but uh, I do find myself attacking the stories from different points of view and and, and then somehow they come together you don't necessarily have to have to work at it but sometimes I do to make these elements come together into a story and, and make sense um, you know when you have gangsters and zombies and creatures that live in the ocean all together in one story you better have that come together somehow in the end it makes sense and to be able to do that to be able to, to look at the story as a puzzle uh, pieces of a puzzle and put it all together into something that flows into a circle is kind of the goal for me, you know, to make the story turn it a circuitous sort of organic thing that flows from start to finish and all interlocks and makes sense. Um, and when I when I see a, a movie or I, or I read a book uh, that has that to it, it gives me a sense of of completion at the end, you know, whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, if it all locks together and makes sense at the end, and I think that that's a, that's, I don't know, I get really excited about that. I'm sort of a story addict in that way. I've always, the funny thing is, like, when I was, I can relate to what you're, to what you're saying regarding, you know, as you start creating more, doing more um, within the field, you know, you start to, you start to read less or if you do, you read. You start to almost become a little bit more picky in what you read, like um, or more critical, as you put it. But um, I've started noticing that since I've started working this website, and I, more often than not, I actually stick to certain writers, certain creators who I know that I've always been able to enjoy their particular style, no matter what they do. Mm-hmm. Like um, Warren Ellis, Grant Morrison, and. Um, um, I can't remember the other one. I think it's um, I think it's Alan Grant because I grew up late reading a lot of his work on Dread, and a lot of his work on the um, Shadow Shadow of the Bat Shadow of the Bat in the nineties. Uh huh. And um, for me, it's almost seems like I read less and less depending on the genre of the title, and more on more depending on just the people behind it. Uh, I think that's um, true. A lot of people, I think you start to re- you start to realize that. You can count on these people to entertain you. And you really, I mean, I find that when I'm following an author or an artist or a, a director, you know, or a screenwriter, that I am chasing, I'm not, if you, you feel like you're on this um, journey where you want, to, you want them to take you on the next step with whatever the project, the next project is, whether it's a continuation of a character that they're doing in a series, or if it's just like the next crazy thing they come up with, you know, like with Grant Morrison, um, you you're chasing that that you're chasing that unicorn, you're chasing the dragon, and you're on this adventure, and you don't want it to stop. When the story's over, you want more, so you're going to go back to that that creator again. And it's important, I think, to also note that these are people, the people that you mentioned, are. Are I think also themselves interested in that same thing. They're they're also ch- they're also trying to keep themselves interested and they're they're invested in their stories, 
and they're invested in and not repeating themselves and and being brilliant, you know. And it's important because that's how you build a fan base is to is to make is to keep people on the edge of their seats. You know, the whole point of a story, the whole point of a comic book, the way that a comic book is written, the way that a comic book is drawn, is so that when you get to the right-hand side of that spread, or when you get to the page where the, the point in the story where you have to turn the page and go to the next page, that you want that reader to be, to not, he just can't wait to turn the page. And you're, you're constantly moving the story from left to right, turn the page, turn the page, turn the page. And if you get to a point where you, this is all academic, but if you get to the point where you're not interested in turning the page and you want to put the book down and move on, then you've lost You've lost your reader, and, and, and your stories, you know, basically just went, you know, hit the bit of dust. So it's really important to keep the pages turning. Um, and when you're done, you should feel like you weren't cheated at the end. You should feel like you were along for a ride where they, you gave, you, you put yourself in the hands of this writer or um, an artist or whoever it is, and and you said, okay, take me on this journey. And at the end, when you feel like you know they've they've given you your money's worth and they've and they've taken you on some adventure with them, you want to feel that again. You want to go back and you want to have that experience again. You can't help it. Uh, and that was how I remember that that feeling when I was a kid, reading uh, three comics in the '70s and feeling like there was this whole world that Marvel had created, that all these things were happening. You know, mostly in Manhattan, <laughs> but sometimes the Everglades. You know, and it was all connected, and you were part of this this world, this secret world. Because for me, when I was reading comics as a kid, I I wasn't, I didn't have a lot of friends who were reading comics. I had maybe one or two friends who were reading comics along with me, and um, a lot of people, you know, in the you know growing up in the Bay Area anyway, in the suburbs, there weren't a lot of comic book readers. But those of us who were reading comics, we were completely immersed in this almost like the secret world that other people either weren't interested in or didn't understand or weren't aware of. And we felt really lucky to be part of that universe. Um, and I think that when you're doing comics as a professional, you're not necessarily always building your own a universe of titles, but you are people are stepping into your chamber and they're stepping into this world that you're creative and you don't want to let them down. And if you're doing your job right, then you are going to get followed by people. You know, um, that's I've never taken doing comics lightly ever. I've never felt like any story I've done, whether it was a ten-page thing or an eight-pager or a hundred and twenty-five-page story, that I, I never took it lightly. I always, when I'm working on anything I do, I, I'm putting myself right in that picture. I'm putting myself in that story, and I'm immersing myself in the details. So that it, it, it doesn't just become a job, but it's it's it, it's a story that you're involved in. You're not just telling the story; you're involved in the story. Um, and this goes back. This is a tradition that goes back with um, some of the great illustrators who who would immerse themselves in in the setting of, of the thing that they were doing. And you have to, you know, Robert E. Howard when he was writing um, his Conan stories would while he was typing he would he'd be speaking everything out loud, all the dialogue and stuff like that, and it was clear that he was living. He was living in these worlds, you know. He's sitting in this little town in Texas, writing these stories and and transporting himself through the power of his imagination outside of Texas, you know, into the Hyborian age or whatever he happened to be writing about. And I think the more that you are in touch with that, the better your stories are going to be automatically. That's that's pretty awesome, and I think that's some um, for any for any artist, any writer. You know, or anyone who wanting to, or wanting to get in that field, that's definitely some advice. That's, in my opinion, at least, that's definitely some advice worth listening to. Because well, it's all about being immersed and realizing that the and taking the reader seriously. Yeah, you 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 have to. I think you have to. I mean, I don't. I don't know. I think about the reader a lot when I'm doing stuff because I am the reader. You know, I'm in there with you. We're in it together, <laughs> you know. Um, there's, uh, I don't want to out anybody or, or or give the wrong impression, but I will say this. So, okay, this is a good example. Um, so I started reading The Walking Dead, 
I was doing a bunch of stuff with Image, and they would they would send me books, and I'd come home from comic shows where I'd see those guys, and and they'd load me up with books. And so I said, look, I want to I want to start reading some of this Walking Dead stuff because I hadn't read anything. So I start reading Walking Dead, and I'm getting I get like you know 50 issues into it, and I and I'm like pissed. I'm super pissed off, and it's just because these characters that I become become invested in start dropping like flies or getting horribly murdered and uh it was just really upsetting crap out of me because i felt like i don't know i i understand that it's a horror survival book you know i get it but it's just not i don't know i think for comics it's a it's a departure i'm not saying it's wrong it just pissed me off Um, and i got to a a point where i had to stop reading the comic and i realized that I think the reason why I was so upset was because I liked these characters and I wanted to see them win at the end. I felt like, you know, the reason that we're telling stories about the the characters that we choose to tell stories about is because sometimes, because these people are the ones who survive. They go through a cycle, you know, and if we were telling stories about the losers and about the people that don't make it, then, I don't know, is that as remarkable as the the story about the ones who do make it? it? It's... It's de- it's highly debatable. It's highly debatable. You know, I think it's a matter of taste. But I I don't know. And also, I have a hard time. If I like a character, I want to ha- I want to keep them around for a while. I don't want to kill them off. It seems to me like um, a lot of people get off on this whole idea of these um, characters getting killed off. And I don't just mean in Walking Dead. It's it's almost like they like it. Like uh, when they talk about, um, or at least when they're when they're talking about these uh, shows on TV. Like when they're doing a review of. Um, of Game of Thrones, they and they talk about oh these characters are dropping like flies left and right, and um, I think maybe the reason that people respond to that is because it seems more real, you know, because the characters aren't being coddled in the story, they're not always getting out of situations alive, um, but at the same time I think that if you, you know, if you're clever enough, you can get them out of it in a way that seems believable. And I think people want that a lot of the time. I think they want to see the hero survive so he can tell another story. He can be in another story another day, you know. But there are different ways of telling a story for sure. There's more than one way to skin a cat. It's kind of funny. Like, you look at a show like something like... I don't know if you've got a chance to watch The Following. Uh, the one with... Um, the Kevin one Bacon? With, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I gave that a pass after like, two episodes. But that's just me. That's just me, you know. Um, I'm not even sure why. <laughs> I can't even tell you why exactly. But uh, I do watch a lot of television. This is not one of them. But I've heard that people really like that show, and I guess I don't know what season it's in now. But but what was your point you're going to make about it? Well, it's actually only on the second season, I believe. But um, one of the things I liked about that show is that even though some characters will get killed off, they'll actually give the characters time to develop. And what I hate is when you have a character... Like, I don't mind if a character is being killed off, but I mm-hmm. I don't want them to be killed off right away. You know, even sure, if you have a sure. character who's going, who is destined to die or something like that mm-hmm. at the writer's hands, flesh them out a little bit, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, plus, I mean, if you just, if you just introduce a character because he's going to be cannon fodder in the second act or something, um, or at the end of the first act, well, I mean, you know, look... Like I said, I read, I read a lot of crime fiction and mysteries. And, you know, people don't always make it in those stories. But, you know, Philip Marlowe doesn't get killed at the end of the story. You know, I mean, you, you've got to have someone to root for. And if, you, and if, you're rooting for, if, you're, if you're rooting for a group of people or a group of heroes, and at the end, only one of them is left standing, yes, that's a horror, that's a horror story. That's, uh, that's, you know, Ripley surviving at the end of Alien. You know, or, or, or any Jason slasher movie. There's always the, the teenage girl that survives at the end, um, usually. And, and then, of course, there's sometimes there's a twist that, that says, ha-ha, she didn't survive. But, uh, you know, I think when you're telling sequential stories and you're telling stories that are serialized and things like that, you, you, re- you really should have someone that you, you can root for. It doesn't necessarily mean that everyone has to survive, I agree. Um, but when you're invested in a character and you really like a character and you and you want to see more from that character and then they're suddenly ripped away from you, yeah, that's a horror story. Um, but for an adventure story, I think that you know you're telling. This, I mean, Conan. You didn't tell. The, we don't tell the story of Conan the Barbarian because because Conan got killed. You know, halfway through the first book. 
you know, it wouldn't be much of a Conan novel. Exactly. And there goes the series. <laughs> there goes the series. Although I will say this: when I'm watching a show like um, Dexter, I don't know if you watch Dexter. You oh, definitely. You watch Dexter. Okay, so I, I stopped watching Dexter halfway through the second to last season because I got pissed off at Dexter because Dexter started playing his sister um, and manipulating her. And up until that point, I, I was okay with Dexter. I mean, he was a serial killer and everything, but there was a point where I felt like he was a guy who had been told he was a serial killer and he was a guy who had been and conditioned into thinking that he was a monster, but really he wasn't necessarily one. He was something else because he had a family. He had Rita. He had the kids. He thought he was a monster, but really he was a guy who'd been screwed up by his stepfather into thinking that he was, you know, um, he was supposed to play this role and he couldn't be anything else. Well, I was wrong <laughs> because... You know, it turns out that um, he's going to get his he's going to get his sister into things, and he's going to talk her out of turning him in. And I felt like there was a lot of manipulation by the writers to make that plausible. One was uh, all of a sudden making it making her fall in love with him, and her discover that she's in love with her, her brother, and um, and so that she wouldn't turn him in, which went against everything that she was about. And I felt like that the writers weren't being true to her character, so I dropped out. And also, I wanted to see Dexter get caught. Because him not getting caught was becoming so ridiculous after a while that I just I couldn't take any more. And I thought, what would be so bad if Dexter got caught, right? What would exactly. happen? You, could, you can't catch Dexter. He can't be caught. I mean, we don't need to see him walking with donuts. At the, you, know, you know what it is like about preserving everyone's job? You know, he has to walk into the police station every morning with a box of donuts because all those people are counting on him for a job so they can be characters in the story and it's or whatever they're thinking because you could have totally put him in prison i would have loved to see a story of what how dexter got along in prison wouldn't you i mean what would be so wrong about that so when i see a story that takes things out and pushes them out into another i don't know another chapter that you weren't expecting um they didn't do it's the same thing with uh, breaking bad i love breaking bad but walter could have been caught they could have caught Walter. It could have gone down that road to see what would have happened. But there was all, there was all this lying going on. And I think that's that, it's, that's my main point is that these characters and a lot of these characters and a lot of these shows get by by lying all the time. And I got kind of sick of it. I kind of had my fill of it with, with Lost. Lost was the same thing. People weren't telling each other things. They were lying to each other. Only for the point of preserving certain plot points. It didn't really make sense that they wouldn't tell each other st things that they were learning about the island. It didn't make sense all the time that they were lying to each other. <clears throat> the writers would convolute things to make it okay for them to lie, but I just got sick of it after a while. Walter just continually lying to the people that he loves was, I just found, just disgusting. And so I can only take so much of that. And I like a show where the characters are honest. Even if they're, even if they're, they're dishonest, as long as they're not, the plot isn't relying so much on lies. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Do you remember something... <laughs> a lie-based plot. Do you remember a term Roger Ebert came up with? I think he called it an idiot plot. <laughs> where, um, like, the whole entire story could be resolved if people just sat down and talked for five minutes. And he called that the idiot romantic plot. Romantic comedies. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, romantic comedies. Uh, it's like my wife and I were talking about that the other day, about how you'll watch a movie or a TV show. And someone will accuse somebody of something else, or they misunderstand someone, and then they, they do that speech, that indignant speech, or the kiss-off speech. And then the other person, when all they have to do is open their mouth and do some explaining, does not, they just they do nothing. They just they go, ah, oh, they kind of, their shoulders slump, and then, and then they don't say anything, and they give up. <clears throat> That's never been me in my life, never, where I just gave up and, and walked away dejected because, oh, why bother even telling her what really happened? I'll wait till the third act. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just want to picture out. you saying that in real life. It's like, like you whoever actually... just goes, whoever you know, you ate the last donut and you ruined my party, and <laughs> and all you could say is like it wasn't me, I didn't do it. Uh, yeah, it sometimes it sounds weak, but you know, if you just came up with a little bit of proof, then you know it's it's uh, because they don't want to write the scene where the person gets all angry and then goes, oh, oh, I'm sorry, because there's there's no conflict there, you know. It doesn't move the plot forward. It, it it actually it actually repairs the conflict. So they they create this this yeah this idiotic sort of um, trumped up conflict to, to push the story forward. And I, God, I hate that. And I hate people who are lying, lying, lying all the time, 
when it'd be so much easier and or not easier, but it'd be so much more fun if they just got caught, you know. And then what happens, you know? I mean, because Skyler lost her mind anyway, you know. Uh, it wasn't like his lying did any good. It just made him a, less and less of a uh, of a, a sympathetic character. So by the time Walter got his just desserts, I felt like he deserved them. I didn't. I wasn't rooting for Walter at the end. I wanted him to get his just desserts. Is that what they wanted us to think? Is like because you know crime stories aren't necessarily about people getting away with it. They're about the folly of crime. You know, going down that road just is not. It's a bumpy ride that doesn't end well. You know, and that's okay. But sometimes when you're watching a, you sort of you know. You want to root for this guy because you like him and you want to see him come through the tunnel at the end somehow um, and redeem himself. You, know, you want some redemption, and sometimes redemption ends in death. I don't know. Sometimes there is none. Sometimes these guys become criminals who blame their folly on other people, You know, and I just have no, no time for those kind of characters. I'm not interested in, um, in being led down the garden path and then, and then stabbed in the back by the rioters. You know what I mean? It's like it happens all the time. <clears throat> you know, or you're led down the garden path thinking that you're going to have some great payoff because you stuck with the series for how many years, and then you turn out that it turns out it's all a dream, or it turns out they're all in heaven, or just cuts or whatever, to, or it just cuts to black at the last minute. Ugh. you know, I just that's what was so great about Fargo. The first season of Fargo wrapped it up at the end. And not necessarily with a nice bow, it was a bow with blood all over it, but I mean, it was, there was, there was resolution. There's nothing wrong with that, you know? There's, it was satisfying. Is there something wrong with a satisfying ending? I don't know. People seem to like it in movies, but in TV, if you give them a satisfying ending, it's almost like, oh, that's just boring, you know? The other one that did it really well that not enough people are talking about, in my opinion, was um, from Death Soul Dawn, the series. Um, I haven't seen that yet. Well, they actually managed to, kind of like the film, they managed mm-hmm. to actually tie the story up in such a way where you could continue telling stories, but without leaving a bunch of plot threads left hanging. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, I think that's, I mean, I don't mind a cliffhanger, but I like it when, when it's sort of half and half. You know, they resolve that storyline, but they open it up for future stories. Because I mean, then you feel like, you feel like your investment of time was worth it, but then you're also ready for the next investment of time, you know, um, instead of, you know, I mean, there's, there's story, there's any number of shows that deal, that they, they, you know, they'll, they'll take advantage of that cliffhanger thing and, and um, the big question mark, you know, like, it's like at the end of uh, Empire Strikes Back, big giant question mark that left people feeling really unsatisfied, unsettled, and hungry for more, but I feel like, uh, you have to give them a little bit more than that. I mean, you know, I have to say, Empire did do that, but just, but sometimes you end things, things get ended so abruptly that you really feel like they left something out, you know? It's kind of like it's, in many ways, like, I, I understand that this is how the movies, how the books ended, but it's kind of like the Lord of the Rings movies in, in a lot of ways. Because mm-hmm. they, mm-hmm. they kept so close to the way that the books ended that you get, at least for the first movie, you get this really kind of unsatisfying ending where they just go into the trees, and it's like, the mm-hmm. end, credits. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I, maybe they learned some lessons with uh, The Hobbit, respect to The Hobbit films, but they're taking so much creative license now with The Hobbit stuff that I kind of wonder if that's the right way to go, too. You know, I'm... I think uh, it's cool to see, like, you know, a bunch of different Lord of the Rings or, or Little Earth-type movies, but taking a little too much license can can piss off the fans. But, yeah, I remember reading that book when I was, oh, man, I was pretty young when I finished Lord of the Rings. So I was probably 11. And I remember being really, really unsatisfied and really like, okay, on to the next book, you know, <laughs> at the end of that one. But yeah, when you're waiting like how many years for for the set, for the next film to come out, that's tough. Because you have to get re you have to get reinvested in it. You know, you have to get re reacquainted when all that time passes. And, and if they sorry, no, no, go ahead. I was going to say it was someone like me who just waited for the extended editions. Uh, it was even a longer amount of time. That's true. That's true. I I remember. Um, I remember just thinking, okay, just get me, just get me the extended editions with the, you know, I'm just waiting for those. 
Um, and to be honest, I haven't even watched um, Return of the King Extended Edition yet. I'm still waiting to watch that. I'm not exactly sure why I haven't I haven't actually sat down and watched it yet, but um, I, I've had it for a long time. Now it's to the point where I, I, I'm going to probably have to get it on Blu-ray. I think I have it on Blu-ray now, but maybe I was waiting for the Blu-ray after a while too. But I, I'm looking forward to it. But I think you can you can also get um, kind of uh, overload, you know. Yeah, kind of burnt out almost. Yeah, you can get a little burnt out, and you have to kind of wait till your your you know your your interest you know comes back. It's like samurai movies. I love uh, watching uh, feudal Japan films, and um, I have to really be in the mood for them though. I can't force them because if I try forcing them, it's just not going to happen. So I get to the point where I, I'm craving watching one. And then after I watch one, I have to watch six more. So uh, I bought all the Lone Wolf and Cub films. Again, I bought them the first time on Laserdisc, and then I just recently bought them again on Blu-ray, and I'm waiting to get that itch, and then I'll sit and probably watch all of them all in a week or something. Did you see the uh, Zatoichi <laughs> Criterion box set that just came out? No, but how many how many films is it? Like 20-something films? Um, I think it's like between 10 and 15. Oh, really? Oh, maybe yeah. it's a volume one. I know there's at least 20 films, but... <clears throat> that's going to be my next thing. I'll, I'll probably have to do that because uh, I love those movies too. Yeah, you know, that's another thing. I, I love, uh, you know, feudal Japan movies, samurai movies, I, 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 medieval Japan. I love all that stuff too. So and I love giant monster movies. I love kaiju films. You know, it's like, I think, you know, you just, like I said, you know, when you become a story addict, you you have to keep feeding the monkey. <laughs> You know, and I definitely have this story monkey. I mean, when I'm not watching movies and I'm reading books and, you know, like I said, you know, occasionally reading comics and then I'm and then I'm telling stories and I'm either writing story ideas down in my notebooks or I'm writing, you know, treatments or it, it just never ends. You know, it's and, you know, when you're when you're when you're writing, it's not like you can control the ideas. They, they come into your head and they persist and you have to write them down. And you want it, and you want to tell those stories. And that the hardest thing is to not be able to tell all the stories you want to tell when you want to do them. I wish, it, you know, I, I joked uh, like a year ago when uh, there was a really big California lottery worth a lot of money, and people would say, "Hey, what would you do if um, if you won?" And we were asking each other the question, and I said, "I would start a comic book company, definitely." You know, because there's a lot of people out there who want to tell stories and they're not able to do it worthwhile stuff and there's a lot of stories I want to tell and I don't have time to draw them all myself you know so I would definitely I would definitely be uh, starting a comic book company and making this stuff happen it's just hard it's hard enough to put out one creator own book as it is for well for me anyway the way I do them let alone more than one so uh, one of the things I want to briefly touch on before we wrap up the interview was actually your work on I mean it wasn't I mean, obviously, you weren't completely involved creati- creatively, as far as like the storytelling. But one of the things I always loved was the were the Ghostbuster covers that you did for mm. uh, I think it was eighty eight miles per hour. Yeah, yeah. The unfortunately, that company it is really unfortunate what happened to that company. But I'm so glad that they're carrying on Ghostbusters comics through IDW. But I always wanted to ask about that particular project and how it came along because I absolutely love those covers. I actually hunted those down because I. Steve Kurth is an awesome artist, don't get me wrong, uh-huh. but those covers are so much more striking, in my opinion. Oh, well, thank you. Um, they were fun to do. I wish I'd gotten paid for all of them. Um, oh. I'm still owed money for, I think, the last cover, but, uh, boy, it was, it's been so long that I guess um, the guy figures he doesn't need to pay me anymore. Uh, so that's a, that's a kind of a weird... It's it's a mixed bag that subject to I me mean, on the one hand it's like yeah they were fun to do and I enjoy doing them but on the other hand it's like hey you owe me some money and uh, it's funny because I'll see like uh, someone did some prints of those they were selling I don't know if it was the, the guy who was publishing those books or if it was someone else who just did bootlegs but I've, I've had them put in front of me to sign from time to time and it's it's I feel a little touchy about it you know um, I'm a huge fan of Ghostbusters I just took my kids to see it uh last week and um it's just it doesn't it just never gets old oh yeah i saw it twice because i work at the draft house part-time and i saw it twice there and that was so much fun 
Yeah, so I um, so I was told, you know, we you know we don't have um, the license doesn't cover likenesses, and I was like, that's totally fine with me. And I just was able to just to kind of just do what I wanted. And I remember I did a couple of drawings. I did a drawing of the Slimer, and then I did a drawing of the dogs, um, sort of prelim kind of uh, sort of sort of loose watercolor things I did just for the hell of it. And I don't think anyone's ever seen those, but I'm not even sure where those are anymore. But the covers were a lot of fun, and I, I would have loved to have done more of them, and I was going to do more of them. But um, just uh, he, I think what happened with, um, do you know what happened with the company? Uh, they went bankrupt. They ran out of money. Well, one thing that did happen that I heard about was they did a Tron comic, and they got approval from Disney and then they for this cover. <clears throat> then they put the book out. They printed the book, and then Disney said, oh, you can't use that cover. We don't like that. They approved it, and then they disapproved it. And he he basically had to, to mulch a whole run of books. Oh, from no. When I, when I was made to understand, which, yes, you would definitely lose a lot of money if that happened. Um, it's not fair. I don't know if legally he had some kind of, you know, stance, you know, that he, he could have gotten away from that but it, it, it hurt him pretty badly and uh put the put the the brakes on the company pretty fast so i think he's a well-meaning guy he's not a crook or anything like that um but uh, yeah it is too bad because I, he was a good guy he he, he had a um, he had a lot of ambitions toward doing some interesting um uh, licensed stuff and he liked my work so he was hiring me um one thing we talked about doing at the time was an adams family comic and i did a couple of drawings for that and I would have loved to have done an Adam's Family comic and if anyone's listening and wants to do an Adam's Family comic I'm still interested <laughs> talk to <laughs> IDW odds are they'll probably do it <laughs> yeah I um, I mean I, I, I think it would be smart for someone to pick it up I think that they would probably sell a lot of copies if they do it right um, you know it's just I would like to see it done more in the Charles Adams vein than in uh, sort of a realistic photo thing you know what I mean? It's like uh, I think if you're going to do the Adams Family, it should be drawn more, more like a cartoon. Yeah, like the old Unless, uh, New York Times comics. There's a lot of comics out there right now in the mainstream that are highly rendered. They're over rendered, in my opinion, and um, there's an over reliance on realism to the point uh, where everything's over rendered, and it's not so much drawn as it is rendered, and you know, the difference for me, the difference between a drawing and a rendering is a rendering is something it's trying to uh, accurately portray uh, either a, a realistic photo or just something realistic, and and rather than putting your the, the artist's opinion into the into the the drawing, you know, um, and it seems like DC is very interested in rendered stuff these days. There's just the more line work you put into something, the you know, like the perception is that the more line work is the is the higher quality of art per lines or something. And I completely disagree with that. I'm not saying that line work is bad, you know. Um, it's just that sometimes the lines don't need to be there, and things don't always have to be drawn perfectly to be to be exciting. You know, in fact, I think, you know, see, that's the problem is like in the artists that I like, I don't know how they would fare today. You know, how does Frank Robbins fare in the world of the 21st century comic book? I don't know. You know, um, I think there's a place for, for everybody. But to to put all your eggs in one basket, I think, is a mistake. And, it, and DC used to be less about, well, I think comics, I shouldn't even attack DC. I'm not attacking DC. But um, I think there's, a, and you should, we should strike that because I'm, you know, I'm employed by them. Well, of course. But uh, <laughs> but no, I think some some mainstream comic book companies, um, they are they've got this overall sort of editorial kind of vision for their titles, and there used to be more diversity than there is now. Let's put it that way. Um, and you could say the same thing about uh, a lot of different businesses, a lot of different mediums, including film and television. There seems to be a little less room for diversity in the forms of storytelling and the styles of. Of, of visuals, you know, than, than there used to be. Not to say that there isn't, there's, there's innovation still happening, but it seems to be centered around similar themes and um, a lot of digital stuff, you know. I mean, obviously, I'm a little, I'm, you know, you might say I'm a little biased against digital work. I'm not. I just think that it's 
it's one of those things is there's so much of it out there, it's going to be a burnout period for people, I think, at some point, you know? I, I but, agree. Uh, uh, that's why I like people like, um, like is it David Aja or David Aja? Aja, I think. The artist who's working on Hawkeye right now. Mm-hmm. And his stuff is just so unlike anyone working in mainstream comic books right now. And I think mm-hmm. that's why he's drawn so much interest and why he... I think he won like three or four Eisners for the work that he oh, did really? on Hawkeye. Hmm. Yep. I'm not even sure if I'm familiar with that stuff. Oh, it's from just from art from a art and a writing perspective. That book is absolutely incredible. If you haven't read Hawkeye by him and Fraction, uh, definitely read that one. I'll have to check this out. I'm looking. I'm looking it up right now while we're talking. Um. And I believe I could be wrong, but I was told by somebody that he actually does everything by hand like and he does the entire process he does the pencils oh you know he, was, he used to draw he was yeah I think he does um he um is he inking his stuff or is someone else inking him um I think he's inking his own stuff because I remember he used to work on Iron Fist as well yeah I'm looking at that right now I actually worked on Iron Fist um around the same time uh yeah you know I mean the guy is just drawing I mean he's drawing um comics and in a way that's dynamic and not overwrought and I you know like you know you, it's that kind of David Mazzucchelli kind of school uh, European feel that things are properly drawn but they're not over rendered Mo- I think that's important For, Mobius was always very like uh, Mo- Mobius of heavy metal fame of course that was always very much it, it's funny, like, his style kind of almost became the European style. Uh, somebody, oh, he's uh, highly influential. There was, a, there was, like, a handful of guys um, that, you know, were highly influential, but then out of that handful of guys, um, probably two or three of them are, you know, Mobius uh, followers or, or, you know, are highly influenced by Mobius. And then he had uh, sure. Richard Corbin from the heavy metal, from the heavy metal school as well. Yeah, uh, it's interesting to um, because I was catching up on the Hellboy stuff that that Corbin did, and the style is so different. It's interesting because I remember um, when I got into heavy metal in high school, I was captivated by Corbin's style because here's a guy who's doing stuff in a you know fully illustrated, full color, painted, drawn, airbrush way that has its own reality to it, but at the same time is also very unreal, very surreal. And that combination, I've always liked that combination in art. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm just checking out Hodge's stuff while we're talking. Not yeah, a problem. Yeah, I remembered when, uh, I remembered when I was doing some Iron Fist stuff. And uh, I did a couple of things for Iron Fist. Yeah, I mean, I'm, um, you know who used to really get me excited was Jorge Zafino. I don't know still him. Gets me excited. He um he did, well he's he passed away in, of cancer in um the last decade but uh, he he you started seeing his stuff in comics around the time I I just broke into comics he's an Argentinian artist who used to do a lot of stuff with Chuck Dixon Chuck was kind of his agent over here um oh, and wow. uh, look at those Batman he did stuff a lot of, he, yeah he he did a he did one Batman story for um you know that Batman uh, uh, anthology series but he did a ton of stuff for Marvel he did a lot of Punisher stuff his first Punisher graphic novel is called The Assassin's Guild I think it was written by Chuck Dixon and it's just amazing stuff it was one of those you know um, 8 by 11 graphic novels that Marvel used to do oh like the um, like the uh, the demon ones that they did yeah, well, you know, Marvel's, Marvel was doing those 8 and by 11 graphic novels for a really long time. They stopped doing them sometime in the 80s, I guess, but um, he did uh, he did Terror, Inc. for the for the Epic line. He did um, Return to Big Nothing, I think. I think Return to the Big Nothing was... No, that was probably Zek. <clears throat> he did several Punisher things. He did a lot of stuff for Marvel. He did some Conan stuff just before the last Conan magazine was, was canceled. I did one story for that that was amazing. His stuff got looser and looser. Um, he was he painted in black. He painted with a brush and ink. His stuff was just 
visceral and exciting and just bold. He, his first thing in comics that, uh, that came out over here was something he did with Chuck called Winter World. And you might be familiar with that because IDW reprinted uh, the material um, not that long ago. I don't know that one, but I'll check it out because I'm huge definitely fan check of out Chuck Winter as well. World. Winter World is, you know, just what it sounds like. It's like a post-apocalyptic uh, Ice Age sort of comic. Very, very uh, brutal sort of Mad Max, you know, in the in the in the snow, and um, God, it's just the artwork is just well, it just blows me away. Highly influential. When I was doing the Black Terror, I was like, I want my guy to be tough looking like Zafino's guys, you know, that this he just has this, this way of drawing faces, and I just even know he might have, he was a uh, an assistant for uh, Ricardo uh, in a, in Enrique Villagran the brothers I guess yeah. in their studio in Argentina and that but the thing is is he I feel that he surpassed them in artistry because he was he became this virtuoso his stuff is so just like fearless and energetic you know it's just got so much vitality to it and I became friends with um, his son who's also who's also an accomplished artist and uh, you know we, we, we'd have these conversations about his father's work and stuff and just how amazing it, um, he was, and to, and to find out that he knew about my work and he liked my work because his son told me that, I just couldn't believe it. I had no idea. <laughs> I was like, really? <laughs> wow. You know, because I feel like I owe a lot to him as an inspiration, you know. So there's just, there's no, that's what I love about, about this medium is there's just no end to of reasons to getting to get excited. I mean, even if I if I if I never read another comic book in, for the rest of my life, I would still love comics. I would still be interested in comics. I would still be captivated by artists and and, and even writers. You know, and it's like you said. You know, you you'll you'll pick up something if some if a certain person drew it or a certain person wrote it. I'm the same way. You know, I don't I don't have this sort of religious bias against comic. When I say religious, I mean I'm not religious about not reading comics. It's not like a hard, it's like this hard, fast rule. I know I no longer read comic books, everybody. It's not true. You know, I pick stuff up and I, I fall in love with things. I mean, my, my latest favorite comic is called Barbarian Lord by Matt Smith. It's a, um, it's kind of a, it's, it's part, it's, it's part sort of Conan parody but to say that is really limiting because it's really not that either it, it owes a lot to Robert E. Howard but it owes just as much to the Icelandic sagas you know and it's poetic and philosophical and violent and 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 um, it's but it's very much a comic book and I re- recommend anyone pick it up because it's just great he started publishing these uh, self-publishing these little square 30 40 page stories that he would sell at shows um, and then uh, a publisher picked up uh, the rights to do a graphic novel, his first graphic novel with his character. And um, I, have, I got advanced copies from him to kind of hand out to people because I was so in love with it. And I, I gave a copy to uh, Walt Simonson, and he liked it. And, <clears throat> and Matt's just, his stuff is amazing. He just gets better and better all the time. Um, I, 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 I sometimes will stumble upon these artists that I want to work with who are kind of just on the cusp of greatness. Not that they're not great artists, but as far as having their careers take off. And I'll find them, and then I'll start working with them on something, and then they get busy. <laughs> it happened with David Heron. David Heron and I were, were doing this thing together called Autumn, which is kind of this, um, it's sort of my ode to uh, Grimm's to, to Grimm's fairy tales and uh, and uh, fantasy, fantasy stories and stuff like that. Um, and a little bit of uh, Japanese feudalism thrown in there, and we were having a great time. And then he started working with, uh, you know, a couple different companies. And then he just took off doing BRPD and Conan, and that was it. You know, I could never get him back after that. And that happens sometimes. It's um, I don't, I haven't figured out the knack of being able to work with an artist when there's no money involved. And there's a lot of guys who can do that. I don't know how they do that. I don't know how Rick Remender does it. I don't know about how Mark Andrew Smith used to do it with uh, the countless books he put out through Image, but these guys can do it. They can find an artist who, who's, who's able to work for no money up front. He's able to work on for back end, and I've never been able to do that, you know. And I don't have the backing of a of a publisher who will just you know wholesale say yes to everything I want to do, you know. Which is why I'm you know which kind of leads us to why I'm um, 
decided to sort of um, to do nocturnals on my own with a partner, you know, um, because I just felt like I was tired of waiting for the right confluence of publisher and deal and financial stuff to kind of come together to make it possible for me to do a new nocturnal series after so long. Just do what Pat Lee does and don't pay them. <laughs> well, if I want to do a nocturnals book, I have to figure out how to pay me. Yeah. You know, I, I can't paint a comic book over the course of six to eight months to a year on, you know, on, 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 on hopes and prayers and well wishes. You know, there has to be, you know, I've got to, I've got to keep the roof over our heads and I've got to keep the heat on or, or the air conditioning on for the, um, for that matter. And when I, so basically I partnered up with a friend of mine who is a small publishing company called Big Wow Art and, uh, his name is Steve Morger. Steve Morger also is one of the major forces behind the Big Wow Comic Fest in San Jose every year, which is a growing show that's become my favorite show. It's it kind of it's it's a lot like WonderCon used to be when it was in Oakland, um, in San Francisco, but it's out there near Silicon Valley, and it's a great show. And Steve's a great guy, and he's he's a true patron of artists. He's um he's got a a, a great um ship with with many great artists spanning you know at least two continents and has supported my work for years for doing sketchbooks and art books and so we've done so far we've done three hardcover full color art books together that's the pretty awesome called, yeah in the last three years it's been great um the first one was called siren and then last year's was called sorceress and then this year's is called enchantress and last month, we finished up a uh, very successful Kickstarter campaign, which was thrilling to both of us because we didn't know what to expect. I'd never done a Kickstarter before. We did a Kickstarter for a, or an expanded edition of Enchantress, and it did very well. We were very happily surprised. Um, and that book will be hitting stores. The regular edition will be hitting stores, um, which is a 96-page full-color hardcover in November, the week of Thanksgiving through Big Wow so if you go to previews you can see Big Wow and previews and you can see the two books that we're offering there they're basically I think come out the same week um, the week of Thanksgiving and the one is Enchantress and the other hardcover is called Nocturnal's Legend Nocturnal's Legend is uh, it's basically an art book it's not a graphic novel it doesn't have any comic book story in it but it's it's basically an art book that encompasses uh, the last 20 plus years of Nocturnal stuff um by stuff, I mean everything ranging from co covers, uh, promotional artwork, um, personal pieces, um, commissioned artwork, trading card art, uh, pinups. I mean, it just the list goes on and on. Anything that I did related to Nocturnals that wasn't comic book page, and even some comic book pages <clears throat> that we've taken some details from and blown up, like some panels that we really like and want to see you know, out there in the book. Um, and things I held on to for years that it's that have never been published and things that people haven't really seen in the public eye. Um, there's so much of it that we couldn't even, we couldn't, we can, not only can we fill, you know, a 152-page book, we could easily fill a 200-page book or a 300-page book, to be honest. Um, but we really had to call out, just, you know, to get the best stuff together and, and, and put it in... Uh, and put it in a 152-page book. We're going to try and expand it without raising the price of the book. We, if we can ex expand the page count without raising the price of the book, we're going to try and do it. Um, so that's a bonus right there. Uh, we decided not to do a Kickstarter for this one because we have another Kickstarter that's going to be coming uh, later in the fall <clears throat> that I can't really announce just yet. It's a little too early. But um, we decided to not burn people out on Kickstarter. So this book will just be coming out through Diamond. And I'm really excited about it because I've been hanging on to this stuff for 20 years. Um, and there's pieces that I, I've wanted to do things with that I've thought, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to do anything with them. I'm just going to hang on to it. I'm not going to you know, show it off too much. I'm not even going to put it up on Facebook or anything like that. I don't want people to see it yet. I want to put it in this book, and I want it to be new when you see it in the book. So as I started compiling you know, this volume of material, 
I started realizing I did not want to write um, text for it that was academic. I didn't want to write captions that would say, this was the cover for Troll Bridge, or this was the cover for issue number three of Dark Forever. I, I really wanted to bring people back to the world of the Nocturnals in the writing, as well as the art for this book. And if I wasn't going to give them a new graphic novel, I wanted to give them something that they could sink their teeth into. <clears throat> because for me, when I go back to the world of the Nocturnal, I want to go back in there and tell more stories. Because these characters are living these lives, you know, in my head. And so why not put that in the book somehow? So the text of the book is all written in the voices of the character, my voice. It's, um, they're not my words. It's, it's recollections, interviews, uh, journal diaries, diary entries, uh, all in the voices of the characters. Transcript of interviews, things like that. As a, as a fan, I am, I am really excited to see that come kind to of fruition. And I'm just so glad that they're the... The universe of the Nocturnals is being expanded upon, and the funny thing is, like, I was over at the um, at um, Austin Books. It's this ma- Austin Books and Comics. It's this major comic store here in Texas, and we were. I was just talking to people about the interview that I was going to be doing tonight, mm. and well, a lot of them hadn't heard of the Nocturnals, and apparently, two or three of them bought Nocturnals that day because oh, wow. they actually had Black Planet. They actually had the original trade for Black Planet there. And a lot of them ended up picking that up, just based off looking at your work in there. Oh wow, that's really great to hear. See, I love hearing those stories. You know, I, I'm. I remember I used to go to Flying Colors Comics in, in Concord. That was my store when I lived in that area, and uh, I was frequenting Flying. Co- Joe Field, who runs the store, was the one who he basically invented Free Comic Book Day, and he's a very influential retailer in the business. He's won several awards, and he runs a great store. And he hasn't expanded his store into a franchise because he really wants to just focus on one location, which I think is smart for him. <clears throat> anyway, I used to go in there and buy comics. And then someone would pick up something I did there in the store. And he'd say, you know, Dan's here right now shopping. I bet he'd sign that for you. And I would hear that, you know, behind me. And I'd turn around and somebody would have a book for me to sign they were picking up. And Joe has sold so many copies of Giant Killer and Nocturnals from that kind of word of mouth. And I love when retailers do that, when they get excited about something. I mean, they all do it, you know. And, and the fact, a retail, when a retailer is a reader, and he's a reader of more than just Marvel and DC or, you know, the big two or the big three or whatever. When they when they are interested in the medium more than the genre, you know what I'm saying? You know, yeah. I mean, you can, it's, everyone's interested in the genre of superheroes, but, I mean, the medium of comics itself is just vast. And to get people who, who will who will stop and say, hey, you should check this out. And then other people who are open to that, that always excites me that someone was open enough to pick it up and take it home. Because it tells me that they're a lot like me, is that they're looking for something new to, to dive into. And my biggest regret with Nocturnals is that there's this following of people that the book has attracted and the stories and the characters have attracted who want more. And, and I just, I, my regret is I wasn't able to give people more in the last 20 years is it like I would have liked to. And so, I, you know, Kickstarter, I have to say, Kickstarter and being able to crowdfund things, I used to be really, uh, I used to look askance at it. I used to be on the fence about it because I felt like it was begging. But let me tell you, what's interesting about Kickstarter, having done one campaign, is that what I noticed is people are really excited about it. And the thing that led me to that wasn't my first Kickstarter, but my first experience as a backer of Kickstarter. I backed eight projects, seven or eight projects. And uh, I you get excited about the creator and the creator's enthusiasm for what they're doing and for the amount of work that you can tell they've already put into it and they're going to put into it. That's why I think those videos, when the videos are well done, you can tell the person was very invested in their project because they were invested in that video. And uh, I knew that if I didn't have a good video, I was sunk. And for a long time, I couldn't figure that out because I don't know how to make a video. And I didn't know anyone who did, but it turned out I did know someone who could make a video, and he made a great video. Um, <clears throat> but uh, having done that first project and having funded it successfully, it, it was like it opened up a vista. And I realized that I could, you know, and this is something I've been thinking about doing for the last year or so. But I just wasn't ready to take the plunge. <clears throat> so I figured, well, you know, if I want to do, 
I want to do new stories. And I want to do new projects with the stuff that I own. I don't have to share it with with a publisher. I don't have to share ownership. I don't have to share control. I don't have to share foreign rights. I can just do this stuff if I have one small partner who's not who's there because he supports an artist and he loves the medium as much as I do and is and, and is and is behind the work, you know, as much as I'm invested in doing the work, then I couldn't find I I just couldn't think of a reason not to do it. <clears throat> so Steve and I have partnered up, so I'm doing um you know, this Nocturnals book through Big Wow and then future stuff that I do will also be through Big Wow. And I definitely am planning on doing on doing a, a future Nocturnals project. I can't talk about it too much right now. It's probably for another conversation, you know, a little down the road. But um, it has opened up a whole new uh, avenue for me. Um, so I'm very excited about that. <clears throat> but this book that I'm that I'm it's, that I'm working on now, we're getting ready to send to the printer in the next month. I've been working on this book for well, I mean, you could say I've been working on it for 20 years, but just really actively working on it for the last year trying to get it right because it took a while for me to figure out how to make this book happen i didn't come up on the idea of how to write the text right off the bat in fact there were people i talked to about the idea who didn't get the idea they were like i don't understand what that what you're doing what does that mean and either i didn't explain it properly or it's just something that people don't necessarily think is going to happen with an art book do you know what i'm saying it's like yeah you know but the way i look at it is if i was if I was a reader, and, and I look at myself as a, as a fan of those characters because I don't, you know, I mean, for me to be invested in, in book like this, I have to think of them as people. I'm not crazy. They're not real. But, you know, these characters exist in their own reality, and I have to be just as invested as in, in, in that reality if I'm going to tell those stories. So I get excited about those characters and what they're up to and what they're doing, and I can't wait to put them through their paces in another story. But for Oh, I want to know what makes them tick a little bit. So I had to sit down and start really letting that come out. And so what does one character think of another character? What What's one character's story? Is there a story that a character can tell um, us that we know or that we've been wondering about? Um, I did a little bit of this with um, the Midnight Companion source book that, was, that, that came out a few years ago through Green Ronin, who was a, a role-playing game company. And they did a source book that was uh, basically a nocturnal's guide that would plug into their superhero role-playing game. But the, the bulk of the book was just a nocturnal's Bible, a guide to the nocturnal's world. And I was able to sit down and write a lot of the backstories and, and descriptions um, that I had rolling around in my head. And I had to nail down some ideas that, I, that were kind of amorphous for a long time. Because, you know, it's better not to tell some of the story. It's better to keep things a, a mystery as long as you can. He can't anymore. And in this story, I've had to lay some things bare. Or I call it a story, but you know, it's not necessarily a story. But there are stories within the book that are told that uh, I have never told before, and I wasn't even aware of them until I sat down and wrote them. I hadn't really let myself nail them down completely. You know, I sort of had an understanding of these characters and who they were and where they came from, but until I sat down to write them, I couldn't really say that I had nailed it down. And I've done that quite a bit with this book. And there's there's even more of it coming. And like you said, expanding the universe is what I want to do. And there is definitely a universe to expand. You know, um, the problem is, is these characters themselves are so interesting that it's sometimes the villains get pushed to the to the edges. Um, in this book that I want to do next, the villains are not pushed to the edges. They are definitely the um, the machinery that runs you know the whole show. But uh, there's a lot of stuff that will happen to the characters and. And it will be of the characters that um, that I think readers will be surprised at the at the things that I'm doing that I wasn't doing before or with them, uh, and the kinds of um, places that the story will go that I haven't gone before. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, but as far as this goes, it's just the same thing. You know, it's not just an art book, and I'm really excited about that. I, I I really want people to be able to pick this book up and get to know who these characters are before they've read a single comic book about them. You know, that's another one of my goals for, for, for Nocturnal's Legend is to sort of introduce people to, you know, something that's been around for 20 years without them feeling like they've missed out on a bunch of stuff. Exactly. Um, before, um, I'm sorry to cut the interview short, but... Um, <laughs> it's okay, you can edit the hell out of it. Uh, um, before, we, before, we wrap up the, uh, before we wrap up the show, um, where can people find you? 
Um, you know, you can always find me on Facebook under Dan Brereton. I've got three pages on Facebook. There's the Dan Brereton artist page. There's my regular page. And then there's Dan Brereton's Nocturnals page. And I, I'm pretty good about posting to those. Uh, there's Nocturnals.com, which is my website, which I try and update, you know, somewhat regularly. Uh, but Facebook is probably the best place to find me. I have an Instagram page that's uh, growing in followers that um, I have to start paying more attention to. I have a friend that's um, been um, kind of the uh, conservator of the Instagram page. But as soon as I turn my attention to that, I'll probably get immersed in that as well. I'm very um, very thankful for social media. It's It's been very helpful. Um, and we still haven't talked about the Batman story too much. Oh, no. <laughs> but, we, but we can again. Yep, we can. This has been a lot of fun. We can definitely. Um, I'd like to actually bring you back on to talk about both the uh, Batman story and, like you said, the further projects that you have coming up uh, regarding that. The further projects that you have coming up. Oh, definitely. I definitely want to come on and talk about them. Um, you know, I. I um, you know, we get caught up in, in talking about comic books and films and story and things like that, and you forget about like the stuff that you're doing. Uh, but uh, but um, you know. I, I just want to say, like, for just just for doing an art book, you know, like Enchantress, um, even that book has some story elements in it that, um, even though it's, you know, there's really no text, there's just a, there's basically a prologue and an epilogue. But even that, I had to put something into a, some somewhat of a theme into the book, even though it's a collection of art from, like, say, the last year or so. I really, I just get so caught up in. The, my love of stories and comics that I, I want everything to count somehow. I, I, w- I would never want to put out just a book that was just called The Art of Dan Brereton. You know, I think that's kind of really, really boring in a way, you know. Um, and I, I feel like there has to be a little bit of magic, as much as magic as you can put into a, into any, any book you put out. I get excited about them, and it makes me want to do more stuff. And uh, I definitely always have something to talk about, that's for sure. Awesome. Well, you know what? If you want, if you'd like to come on, maybe sometime this month or next month, we'd lo- I'd love to do a follow up to the show. This is a really, this there was a lot of ground covered in the show, and I think, in many ways, people want to know just as much what writers, what writers, artists, um, and what what we do on a, what on one of our other shows called Cosplay Circuits. We will bring people on, and we will actually let people get to know them, and not just the work that they put out. Because mm-hmm. I think a lot of people, it's kind of like when you go on a lot of these online channels like our site or on YouTube, and a lot of these people assume that they know the person just through the work that they put out. And Yeah. yeah. It's, that's true. It's true. It's funny because uh, when I'll, I'll, I'll have something on my, my drawing board that I'm working on, and I'll take a picture of it, and I'll throw, up on, throw it up on Facebook. And what I've noticed is that, and I'm, 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 I'm hip to this now, I'm wise to it now, but what I've noticed is that people will look at what you did on your, your board and what you're working on, and they'll respond to that. But then there's this whole other group of people that are responding to things that are, that are in the picture, things in the background, something that's on the wall, some tchotchke you've got in your desk. They want to know those details. I'm interested in those details. Uh, there's actually a whole book by uh, Greg Sampson, uh, who's um, a photographer, and uh, wait, did I say Samson? It's Greg Preston. Greg Preston. So Greg Preston put out a book through Dark Horse a few years ago. It's basically photographs of artists in their studios, and he's looking to put out a second one because he has a whole second volume. And they're fascinating to me because no one studio is even remotely alike. You know, you think in your mind you think, oh, well, everyone's got toys. Well, no, not everyone has toys. <laughs> you know. Not everyone even has a has a, a drawing table necessarily. It's you know some guys just have a computer. Um, but that, it just fascinates me to to learn more about the details of the lives of artists. And I think that's why um, so many stories and are coming out now about writers, about stories about writers, because the writers most of the time are as interesting as their work, if not more. You know. Uh, so yeah, I definitely, I definitely share that that interest, and I'd love to come back and, and talk more. Definitely, uh, maybe toward the end of the month, you know, would be cool. All right. Well, with that, let's. I guess we can call this part one of our interview with Dan Breton, and um, and I just totally lost my words. All right. <laughs> we'll start over. <laughs> yeah. Three, 
two, one. All right, and I guess with that, it brings us to the end of part one of our interview with Dan with comic book artist and writer Dan Breton. Um, Let's start over again. It's Brereton, just because I want you Brereton. to... Brereton. 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 Okay. Brereton. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, well, with that, it bring, we come to the close of part one of our interview with comic book writer and artist Dan Breton. Here are our newest episode of Geeks for Comics. I'm Ian McIntosh. And thank you, thank you for listening. And keep on reading comic books, because you know what? They're pretty damn awesome. And the president thinks so, too. Yep. And <laughs> with, we won't go into that too much, because I don't like to bring in my politics, but you know what? He's right on that one. Well, what is he, like, maybe the first president to admit that he, that he read comics? I mean, I think that's pretty cool, you know, regardless of politics. I'm gonna I'm gonna cut out that, that last part because like I'm like <laughs> right in Texas.